right, and next up we have Dr. Sadika Watson. So perhaps as I get set up here, um, I can add to my resume that uh, Max opened for me. So now I'm kind of a big deal, I guess. All right. Okay. So um, good afternoon. So my name is Sadiqa Watson. I am a senior data scientist at a consulting firm called Illicit Insights. Most of our projects at Illicit are um, in the customer analytics and employee analytics space, and I'd be happy to chat more about some of those projects after this session. Uh, but this presentation is about a fun little side project that I've been working on, so um, I've listed my speaker affiliation here, Coralasi Data Insights. So, um, title, uh, Neural Networks for Longitudinal Data Analysis. Um, first, let's start with the definition. Um, so, longitudinal data are recorded on the same units at multiple points in time. And so, as an example, you could think about a clinical trial where you might have a patient observed over multiple time points, maybe every three months, every six months or something. They come in, then you take their vital signs, um, you weigh them, you take blood or tissue samples, and then maybe you record some biomarkers at each of the different time points. Um, so that's a healthcare example. Uh, another example could come from retail, where uh, maybe you'd observe a customer's behaviors or characteristics um, every month. Or perhaps you're analyzing user behavior, so maybe you're at Facebook or Twitter, and um, you're looking at how the users behave or interact with the platform every day. So there are lots of other examples. In those applications, we're looking at um, people over time, but we could also have a longitudinal data set that stores information about buildings or objects, pets, anything really, whatever it is where, again, we're looking at the same thing over multiple time points. And they don't have to be, but the, usually the time points are evenly spaced, so um, say we're making observations every day or every month. Um, and then the units don't necessarily have to have the same number of observations. So thinking back to that clinical trial example, um, some patients might come in only twice, and then some patients might come in 10 times. And you can think of each unit as having a matrix of data where the variables are observed or across the top of the matrix and the time points are in the rows. Sean Lehman um, has a baseball database that is a fantastic example of longitudinal uh, data collection. His data set has information about players in various roles and positions going back to about 1871. And these data are available in the R package called Lehman. Um, so when you install the package, you'll automatically get access to all of those data sets. But you could also visit his website and download those as CSVs um, from his website. And when we load the uh, tables, we get information about how well the uh, players performed, how well their teams performed as a group, whether they won any awards, whether they switched teams, all sorts of great information about the players. And for baseball hitters in particular, the batting statistics table captures all of the usual performance metrics that are commonly reported on how well they were hitting. In particular, there are three primary baseball outcomes that make up what's called the slash line, um, and these include the batting average, the on-base percentage, and the slugging percentage. And these are usually reported as decimal numbers that are rounded to three decimal places with slashes uh, in between them in that particular order. So let's suppose that we are particularly interested in three baseball players, and we know a lot of information about them over the past three seasons, but we like to know or predict how they're going to perform in the following season. So can we do that? Uh, the first player in our collection of three players is Willie Mays, and again, we're just a spit's throw away from Black History Month, so I wanted to make sure I highlighted a, a, a high-performing African-American player. Um, so Willie Mays, he had this incredible season in 1965, and in his slash line, um, both his on-base percentage and his slugging percentage led the league, um, so he's just this powerhouse of a player, right? In particular, 1965 was a good year for him. The second player is Greg Nettles. Um, he, uh, in 1986, was playing his 20th season um, as a 41-year-old, which is really old for a, for a player, for a non-pitching uh, 
uh, <laughs> or an bitching player. I'm almost 40, so you know, it's very young for other situations. Uh, <laughs> And so his performance in 1986 was okay, right? So he's an example of a moderate player. And then we finally have uh, Chris Davis, uh, who had a terrible season in 2018. I'm sure maybe some of the baseball fans probably know a lot about him. He signed this massive $161 million contract and has been just vastly unperforming, underperforming that. Um, and so, uh, and, and that year in particular, like I said, was a terrible year. So, uh, so the question is, now that we have these three players in mind um, with varying performance, with their actual slash lines uh, shown below, we like to somehow uh, build a model that can predict these outcomes. Now for this type of scenario, we have three key modeling considerations. First, we know that there is a very strong correlation between past performance and future performance. So data from one year uh, to the next are highly correlated, and so we should have some sort of smart way to encode, uh, encode these, these temporal uh, dependencies and exploit them if possible. Next, we'd like to avoid, um, max left, right? We'd like to avoid uh, <laughs> feature engineering um, over the different time periods, and uh, so, if you may have been dealing with this type of scenario in the past, maybe if you had data over multiple time points, you might say, okay, let me aggregate somehow over the different time points how many runs they had or look at some percentage from one period to the next or something like that. And then we might also have to manually encode some of the interactions between some of the variables. Now, obviously, we're limited by time and our own imaginations, right? So there's almost an infinite number of ways that you could do that. And so we'd like to, if possible, allow the algorithm to come up with the those types of transformations. And then finally, um, we would like this model to flexibly accommodate different types of model outputs. Uh, we might want to predict more than one outcome at a time, so uh, such as in our example where uh, we want to predict the three numbers in the slash line, and normally in a regression you would have three separate models, right, where you individually predict those three, um, those three outcomes, and then so each of those individual models are learning separate patterns that are predictive of each of those outcomes, but maybe you want to have one model maybe it's easier to maintain, um, that looks at individual patterns that can come together and simultaneously predict all of those outcomes. And maybe we also want to think about um, predicting over multiple time points. So maybe saying for those three players, could we predict how they performed over the next two or three seasons, right? So that's a lot to ask. Is there a modeling framework that can do all of that? Okay, so recurrent neural network models to the rescue. Um, those, um, for people who have seen those before, um, you may have been aware that those naturally accommodate temporal dependencies. You've probably seen them before in um, different types of sequential data analyses, such as written text or audio. Um, there are some variants such as long short-term memory and gated recurrent units that can regulate the flow of information uh, through the network from, uh, and in particular, looking at data from one period to the next. So this slide shows an example of how information would flow uh, through such a network um, uh, for our um, incredible season, uh, 1965 season for our high performing player, Willie Mays. And we see that he has the same attributes, age, games, uh, number of hits, number of runs, et cetera, recorded um, at, uh, with different values for each of these uh, years in 1962, 1963, and 1964. And so the model is learning uh, all of these season-to-season -season patterns over all the players that are predictive of these uh, three outcomes in the slash line. To prepare the data, we must break each player's record into these four, uh, these rolling four season windows. And so what that includes is the three seasons, remember, that we're using for prediction. Those, so those will be the input years of data. And then we've got the one season in the future, right? So one of the things that was an issue, of course, because players are not active every single year, um, is that if they were inactive for a particular season, we have to do some padding. And so there are some utilities in R that were helpful for that. Um, but we have to pad the series to accommodate the skipped years. But for example, for Willie Mays, we could um, think about predicting 1962. So we're using the data from 59, 60, and 61, and using that to predict his 62 performance. 
And he was also active in 63, so we can slide that window to the right and have 60, 60, and 62 predict, predicting 63. And we can do it again to predict 64 and slide it over one more time to predict 65. Now this of course means that our data samples are not independent. And this is okay for now because uh, we're focusing primarily on the predictions that we're getting from um, the model at the moment. But there are some other aspects of this model where we will have to address this um, dependence issue uh, head on and so I'll revisit that a little later in the talk. I focused on data collected between 1916 and 2018, and I only looked at the player's first stint, so I didn't um, consider what happened after they were traded to another team. And this was really just more of, um, because of the way that the data was collected, it was actually uh, reporting performance on each individual stint. I could have also aggregated across the different time points if I was doing this for real, but again, this was just an illustration. I only looked at players that had at least four consecutive seasons, and, um, Think about the way that I'm constructing these rolling windows. So a player that has a longer career uh, has more rolling windows, right? I'm sliding that window over a longer period of time, so th that player will have more points in the data set. So to limit their influence, I downsampled players that had longer careers. And then to focus on hitters, I required the player to have at least 85 uh, plate appearances. Now, um, another issue is that, um, so we also want to avoid uh, data leakage, and so um, think about the fact that we randomly are splitting the data into training and testing and validation sets. Um, it's possible to have the same player represented in training and testing and validation if we're not careful, right? And so in order to avoid that, one thing we could do is to just randomly split on the players. So you have the training players, the validation players, testing players, and then you can compute the rolling windows for those individual players uh, all across the data splits. As a benchmark, I fit an ordinary least squares regression model where the seasons, the three, the three seasons of player data are represented in Y format. So if we had 100 features, that means we've got 300 columns of data. And uh, for 100 for each time period, I didn't do any manual feature engineering. Remember, that was one of the things I said in the beginning that I was trying to avoid. Um, and I um, just used the data as it was, aside from doing some um, normalization to the 0, 1 scale for the uh, attribute and features, and I did that for the neural network approach as well. Um, for the neural network approach, I tried different models that included one or more gated recurrent unit uh, layers, and then one or more fully connected dense layers with tons of hyperparameter values tuned over the grid. And then I um, represented the model in two ways. Um, the first approach was to look at three single outcome models, um, where each model is just predicting a single metric in the slash line. And then I also pre uh, looked at a multi-outcome model where I'm simultaneously predicting all three metrics. It isn't on the slide, again, but I mentioned that um, normalization to the 0, 1 scale. And um, so Max's talk just before this one was timely. Um, again, just thinking about model tuning and how important that is in machine learning and in neural networks in particular. So uh, you're probably aware that these models involve a lot of parameters that must be tuned. And a single run of this kind of model can take you know, many minutes or hours or days sometimes. And so to cut down on the computational time, I use free services from Google Colab. Uh, they allow you to use a GPU for free um, within reason. Obviously, I think they put some limits of up to 12 hours of, of, uh, of modeling, but that was completely free. So that was helpful here, um, especially for projects where you're just kind of playing around with something. Obviously, you'd want to probably use something like AWS, you know, the GPU if you're working on a real project. Uh, my GitHub repository has a complete minimal example um, showing how you could potentially implement this type of model in R. Um, the version that I'm showing doesn't include all of the data joins and filtering and data transformations that were specific to the, the baseball example. Um, so if you run this, you won't see the results that I'm going to share on the next few slides. But I did it this way because I wanted to keep this example simple enough so that um, you could think of this as a template um, that you could modify for your purposes uh, as, and use it as inspiration for your projects. Okay, so after all of that, how did we do, right, in our three modeling approaches? 
The first graph uh, that I'm going to show here shows the performance in the ordinary least squares regression model on our held out test set. And so for each outcome in the slash line, I'm plotting the predicted values against the actual values. And this dashed line is a reference that shows where the actuals match the predicted, which is where we want a majority of our points to lie in a great prediction model. And as we can see, this is not a great prediction model, right? <laughs> Terrible. Okay, uh, and our three selected players' performances are shown in the colored stars. I don't know if you can see those, but uh, I, I chose red for terrible, yellow for moderate, and green for great. Um, so again, it doesn't seem to be doing a good job of predicting the outcomes for any of them. Next, we see the performance of the best gradient boosted machine um, regression models that we observed over the grid of hyperparameter values. Um, and it, it, you might have noticed from this slide uh, compared to the previous one that the mean square error is lower, um, but it doesn't appear to be doing a much better job of uh, predicting uh, compared to even ordinarily squares. And so I have a couple theories about that. One is that um, we, again, there's the data from time point one, time point two, time point three, where it's not actually clear to the data, um, to, the, to the model, that there's some temporal dependency here. So that's actually not being captured there. So that's one thing, and there, the second is that there might be some types of data transformations or you know, interactions or something that where if, if we were to manually encode some of those things, um, maybe the model might, um, might be better. Okay, and then finally we have our neural network model fits, and notice how a majority of the points lie close to the line, often on the line. And for our three selected players, the model was able to capture Willie May's excellent performance, Greg Nettle's okay performance, and Chris Davis's terrible performance in those three specific years. So yeah, I can quit my job and work in fantasy baseball and uh, you make a lot of money, right? No. <laughs> um, so obviously this was done more for illustration purposes. If I was really trying to deploy this, of course I'd have to you know, do a lot of other types of validation. Um, but again, this is illustrating the, the point that these types of models are useful for longitudinal data analysis. There are some issues that I haven't talked about in this short talk that we might explore in a future session. I mentioned earlier that um, the neural network uh, enables you to predict multiple time steps in the future, but I haven't talked about how you would do that. Um, really that it just involves changing the shape of the output layer. Um, and so that's just making some, you'd also have to make some adjustments to the loss function, um, potentially if you were wanting to, for example, emphasize that you want the model to perform better in earlier time points compared to later time points or later versus earlier or something like that. So those are, those are things that you could do. Um, and then the elephant in the room, again, is that I have not talked about um, prediction intervals. So we talked about point estimates, estimating that one number, but getting some sort of, um, estimate of some range of values, some reasonable range of values that that actual value could lie uh, within is something that we would have to um, spend a little bit more time thinking about. Remember, we were talking about that correlation structure from before. Um, there's this l nagging dependence issue where we've in that we've introduced by um, producing these rolling windows. So that's something we would certainly have to work out. And then here are uh, the reference links to the Sean Lehman uh, baseball data sets that I referenced earlier, and I also give you the link to my GitHub repo where um, the slides and the code are available. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions. Um, first one is, what packages did you use to train your models? Um, great, and I actually just deleted that slide. Um, so the uh, ordinary least squares regression model was just based on the um, uh, the stats package. Um, I fit the GBMs using H2O, and then the neural network models uh, were fit using TensorFlow and Keras packages. And all of this was done in R, of course. All right, and then how do you deal with cases where certain players may have more or less past observations? For example, predicting one player in his 12th season and another in his third. Uh, so the length of the season, remember we, we uh, intentionally use that common length of time, uh, of, of, of window, remember, where we had, the task was to predict using the player's previous three seasons, 
what their next performance was going to be in the following season. So in that sense, it really didn't matter how long they had uh, played overall. It was a sense of how can we actually translate that data structure into the one that the model is actually going to represent that represents this particular modeling task. Um, but that is actually a really good question because as I'm sure if you've worked with LSTMs and these kinds of models, um, they are, they can accommodate various lengths, right? So you could potentially say, given the player's entire history, given a player that has played, whether they played two years or 10 years or however long they've played, what is their last season going to be, right? And it is very easy to do that. You don't necessarily have to specify ahead of time or, or lock in a particular length of season. And so that, that's fairly easy to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have time to go into that solution, but it is very straightforward to do. All right, one more question. What are some diagnostic plots slash sanity checks you can use to see if your RNN is behaving properly? Sure, great question. Uh, I didn't really go into it as much, but I flashed up on the screen. Let's see if I can go back to it. Um, so the example that I provided on my GitHub page does provide some um, Two, piece, two types of graphs. One is just the individual loss function, losses for the individual outcomes. So that's for each of the different outcomes in the slash line individually. And then there's this overall loss function. So you could actually see how those lines are behaving, whether or not we're actually getting convergence, whether or not we're actually continuing to see training beyond a certain number of iterations. And then also just uh, as a means of monitoring in intuitive terms how well the model's doing. On the right side, I'm also just showing that predictive versus actual plot as well. But yeah, there's a, a ton of other things that you, could, um, that you could do. Perfect, thank you so much. And next up, we have Nick Strayer.